like to hear. It's going to be a show with a little bit of audience participation, so a lively group is always better. My name is Todd Jelt. I'm fortunate enough to be the director of this fantastic performance. Before we get started this evening, though, there's a few things we need to go over. First, if you have a cell phone, please take this time now to turn it to silent or turn it off. Nothing ruins your experience or ours more than that unwanted sound of an annoying ring from some solicitor we don't know. <laughs> Great, so at this time it would be wise for me to give thanks to our sponsor, the Inn at Manchester. Please around. <laughs> Not only a community member who supports the arts, but fortunately for me, my employer, and maybe more important, the owners are my friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also like to say that uh, you have a choice. And this afternoon you made a choice to come here, and we appreciate that. That makes you art-loving participants, just like the people in this book. They had a choice, and they spent their money to advertise for you. So when you have a chance, and you have a choice, please look to these people first to spend your dollars in our community, because they are art supporters like you are as well. Thank you. Here, here. Theater like this works because we have people who like to perform and like to be part of the technical aspects, but we always need more. We need more volunteers. We need more resources, both personally and financially. There are lots of ways for you to be involved. The number one way is probably to become a member of the Dorset Players. You can do that simply by going to dorsetplayers.org and finding out how to do that. You'll be connected to an email. You'll know about all the things that are happening here. Which leads me to the next thing, because right after this show, just weeks away, behind this curtain, <laughs> is the actual set for On Golden Ponds, which will be on this stage March 6, 7, 8, 13, 14, 15, followed by the 17th Annual One Act Festival, April 4, 5, 4, 3, 4, and 5, Freddie Shahadi and the Expressions, <laughs> April 11th, and ending our season with Nonsense, the Second Coming, May 15, 16, 17, 20, 23, 24, all shows that I'm sure you'll love if you love this one. So it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this final performance of the complete works of William Shakespeare at Bridge. Sit back, enjoy, and I hope none of you get barfed on. <laughs> Shakespearean scholars, 
He has a bachelor's degree from the Savannah College of Art and Design, <laughs> where I believe he's read two books on William Shakespeare. <laughs> he is going to provide a brief preface to the complete works of Rich. So please welcome me in joining Mr. Joseph R. Moser. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. William Shakespeare, playwright, poet, actor, philosopher, a man whose creative and literary genius has had an immeasurably profound influence upon the consciousness and culture of the entire English-speaking world. And yet, how much do we, as inhabitants of the 21st century, know and appreciate of the tremendous body of work contained in this single volume? <coughs> Too little, I would argue. I believe I could illustrate this point by conducting a brief poll among our audience here. Bob, if I could have the house lights for just a moment, please. There we are. Now, you are a theater-going crowd, no doubt of above-average cultural and literary awareness. <laughs> and yet, if I may have just by a show of hands, how many of you have ever seen or read any play by William Shakespeare? Any contact with the bard at all? Just raise your hands. I think they may know more than we do. <laughs> I think we better get out of here. Just keep going. No, seriously, we should stop running now. They don't know Shakespeare from Shinola. Just keep going. <laughs> what should I do? <clears throat> what? Now it down. <clears throat> Why don't we try to narrow it down a bit? How many of you have ever seen or read, let's say, All's Well That Ends Well? Ah, oh, that seems to be separating the wheat from the chaff right <laughs> now. But let's see if we can find out who our true Shakespeare trivia champs are tonight. Has anyone ever seen or read King John? King John? Really? You have? Do you mind telling me what it's about? <laughs> it's about a hunchback. <laughs> This is exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you laugh, you scoff, but let he among you who is free from sin live in a glass house. For that face, ladies and gentlemen, that face represents all of your faces. That empty brain represents your empty brains. Those glazed eyes are your glazed eyes. And these teeth are your teeth. And they cry out, floss me. <laughs> to you, ladies and gentlemen, that our society's collective capacity to comprehend, let alone attain the genius of a William Shakespeare has been systematically shrunken by sitcoms, molested by Miley Cyrus, and reamed by reality television. But have no fear. Your intellectual redemption is here. Sing it, brother. We descend among you on a mission from God and the holy muses to spread the holy word of the bar to the masses. Testify to help you take those first halting steps out of the 21st century quagmire of Kardashians and Duck Dynasties and into the future. Amen. A glorious future. A future where manly men wear pink tights with pride. A future where this book will be found in every hotel room. <laughs> this is my dream, ladies and gentlemen, and it begins here tonight. Come with us down the path towards a brave new world of intellectual redemption and open your hearts. Yes, open your hearts and your pocketbooks and download the app and Venmo us your donations now to 976 Bar. Give us cash if we be friends and deduct it when the tax year ends. On with the show. May the bar be with you. Thank you and hallelujah! Mr. Christopher D. Rastino. Start and everything. As you can see, I'm not an audience member. 
I completely fooled you. <laughs> Just get on with it. Uh, William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare was born in 1564 in the town of Stratford-upon-Avon, Warwickshire. The third of eight children, he was the eldest son of John Shakespeare, a locally prominent merchant, and Mary Arden, daughter of a Roman, Catholic member of the landed gentry. <laughs> in 1582, he married Anne Hathaway, a farmer's daughter. Uh, farmer's daughters. <clears throat> he is supposed to have left Stratford after he was caught poaching in the deer park of a local justice of the peace. Shakespeare arrived in London in 1588, and by 1592, he had achieved success as an actor and a playwright. After 1608, his dramatic production lessened, and it seems he meant he spent more time in Stratford. There, he dictated to his secretary, Rudolf Hess, the work Mein Kampf, <laughs> in which he set forth his programs for the restoration of Germany to a dominant position in Europe. <laughs> After reoccupying the Rhineland zone between France and Germany and annexing Austria, the Sudetenland, and the remainder of Czechoslovakia, Shakespeare invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, thus precipitating World War II. I never knew that before. Shakespeare remained in the city until the Russians entered the city on uh, April 1st, 1945, and committed suicide with his, with his mistress, Ava Braun. He lies buried in the church at Stratford. Thank you. Now, without further ado, we are proud to prevent the complete works of William Shakespeare. <laughs> Quarrel, sir. Ha, quarrel, sir. No, sir. 
But if you do, sir, for you, I serve as good a man as you. Ha! No better. Yes. Better. <laughs> you lie! Henceforth I never shall be Romeo. Call you what? 
some of Shakespeare's plays set in such bizarre locations as, well, uh, the lunar landscape, Nazi concentration camps, and even Pownal, Vermont. <laughs> in this day, Joe has traced the roots of Shakespeare's symbolism through the context of a pre-Nietzschean society, through the totality of a jejun circular relationship of form, contrasted with the complete otherness of metaphysical cosmologies and the ethical mores in the collective subconscious of an agrarian race. So now, we present Shakespeare's first tragedy, Titus Andronicus, as a cooking show. <laughs> Too well. For 
never was there a story of more woe than this of Othello and his Desdemono. Oh, 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 Jesse. Bob, could I have some more lights, please? Oh, we left Chris to do his own research for this show. <laughs> he must have looked up more in the dictionary and thought it was a place where you tie up boats. <laughs> Which, in this context, is totally pea brain. In the 16th century, the word more referred to a person of African descent. <laughs> Now I feel like a complete dork. <laughs> now, we obviously have a bit of a problem in performing with Fellow, as the part was written for a black man, and we're not. I mean, it's the only way. I don't know. Even remote. Yeah, I mean, salt. Saltine? Really spicy. Triscuits? Well, we're honkies, basically, is what we are. So the underlying theme here is that due to physical limitations, we will be unable to perform Othello the more events. Guys, so move we'll right along to, to, uh, to uh, hey, just because we're we're not black doesn't mean that we, just because we're white doesn't mean we can't do Ophelia, right? So uh, I got an idea. Like, no, just uh, just no no. Guys, stick with me. It's better than the boats. It's better than the boats. Just like you know, just uh, just kind of kind of join in. Here's a story of a brother by the name of Othello. He liked white women and he liked green jello. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and a punk named Iago who made himself a menace because he didn't like Othello, the more of Venice. Whoa! Oh! <laughs> now Othello got married to Desdemona. He took off for the wars and he left her alone. It was a Mona. A drona. He left her alone. He didn't write a letter and he didn't telephone her. Yeah. Hey! <laughs> now, a fellow loved Desi like a donut loved Venus. And Desi loved a fellow because he had a big sword. And a yellow had a plan that was clever and slick. He was crafty, he was sly, he was sort of a jerk. He said, I'm going to shaft the more. How are you going to do it? Tell us. Well, I know his tragic flaw is that he's too, too damn, damn jealous. jealous. I need a dupe, a dope, a kind of schmo. So we find a chum sucker by the name of a Cassio. And he plants on Desdemona's handkerchief. And if Bella gets to wonder just maybe Eve, while he been a fighting, commanded an army, a Desi and Cass playing hide the salami. Salami! Salami! So he come back home and he smothered the bitch. And he thinks he pulled it off without a hitch. But there's a Amelia at the door. Who we met in Act 4. We see a big dummy. She weren't no whore. She was pure. She was clean. Virginal too. So why'd you have to go and make her face turn blue? It's true. It's you. Now what you gonna do? And a fella say. Damn, this is getting pretty scary. So he pulled out his blade and committed Harry Carey. Ooh, ah, 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 ooh, ah, ah, ooh. Do that funky more thing, white boy. <laughs> now, now, Yago got off on a technicality. He moved to Hollywood and got his own TV show. Sure, that is naked and free. Africa. N C I S Africa. Woo! Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, why don't we take a break from the tragedies and move on to the comedies for a while? Uh, comedies. 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 Now, when it comes to comedies, Shakespeare was a genius at borrowing and adapting plot devices from different theatrical traditions. That's right. These influences include the Roman plays of Plautus and Terence, Ovid's Metamorphosis, which are hysterically funny. Huh. Not. And the rich Italian tradition of Commedia dell'arte. Yeah, well, basically, Shakespeare stole everything he ever wrote. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stole is kind of strong, bro. Distilled, maybe. Okay, then he distilled the three or four funniest gimmicks of his time and milked them into 16 plays. Well, yeah. You see, essentially, Shakespeare was a formula writer. Once he found a device that worked, he liked to use it over and over and over again. So, Mr. Shakespeare, the question we have is this. Why did you write 16 comedies when you could have written just one? In answer to this question, ladies and gentlemen, we have taken the liberty of condensing all 16 of Shakespeare's comedies down into a single play, which we have entitled The Comedy of Two Well-Measured Gentlemen Lost in the Merry Wives of Venice on a Midsummer's Twelfth Night in 
winter. Or, Cymbeline taming Pericles the merchant in a tempest of love as much as you like it, or not. Or, the, the love boat goes to Verona. Comedy. 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 Act one. A Spanish duke swears an oath of celibacy and turns over the rule of his king into his sadistic and terrible twin brother. He lives with some fantastical feats of magic and sets sail for the golden age of Greece. Along with his daughters, three beautiful and virginal sets of identical twins. <laughs> While rounding the heel of Italy, the Duke's ship is caught in a terrible tempest, which in its fury casts the Duke upon a desert island. Along with his loveliness among the virginal of his daughters, this innocent vision of loveliness stumbles into a dark cave where she's molested by an inhuman green monster who represents the extreme right wing of the Republican Party. <laughs> Act two, the long lost children of the Duke's brother, also coincidentally three sets of identical twins, have just arrived in Italy. Though still possessed of an inner nobility, they are ragged, destitute, penniless, flea-infested shadows of the men they once were, and in the utmost extremity have to borrow money off an old Jew who deceives them into putting down their brains as collateral on the, on the loan. Meanwhile, the six brothers fall in love with six Italian sisters, three of whom are contentious, sharp-tongued little shrews, while the other three are submissive, di dim-witted little bimbos. Act three. The shipwrecked identical daughters of the Duke wash up on the shores of Italy, disguise themselves as men, and become pages to the shrews and matchmakers to the Duke's brother's sons. They lead all the lovers into a nearby forest, where on a midsummer's night, a mischie some mischievous fairy squeeze the aphroditic juice of a hermaphroditic flower into the shrew's eyes, causing them to fall in love with their own pages, who in turn have fallen in love with the Duke's brother's sons, while the queen of the fairies seduces a jackass, and they all have a lovely bisexual animalistic orgy. <laughs> Act, Act, Act four. four. The elderly fathers of the Italian sisters, finding their daughters missing, dispatch messages to the pages, telling them to kill any man in the vicinity. However, unable to find men in the forest, the faithful messengers, in a final act of misguided loyalty, deliver the messages to each other and kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the Duke, the monster and the Duke arrive in the forest disguised as Russians, and for no apparent reason, put on a two-man underwater version of Uncle Vanya. The pages and the bimbos get into a knockdown drag out fight in the mud, during which the pages' clothes get ripped off, revealing female genitalia. The Duke recognizes his daughters. Uh, the Duke's brother's sons recognize their uncle. And the magician turns the monster into a new. Oh, well, they all get married and go out to dinner. Except for a minor character in the second act who gets eaten by a bear. Ha! <laughs> and also, the, uh, the, the six sons, unable to pay back the old Jew, give themselves lobotomies. <laughs> and they all live happily, happily ever, ever after. Ah, we now move on to the rest of Shakespeare's tragedies because basically we found that the comedies are half as funny as the tragedies. <laughs> Take, for example, Shakespeare's Scottish play. No, Mex oh, Chris, 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 not here. Oh, oh, my God. Oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, God. Which you're really not supposed to talk about in the theater. Unless you're performing it because it's cursed. <laughs> Fortunately, however, we not only perform an abbreviated version of Macbeth. <laughs> uh, but after much thorough research, we're able to do so. In perfect Scottish accents! <laughs> double, double toil and trouble! <laughs> Stay ye imperfect, Mac Speaker! Mac, tell me, Mac Moore! Ah, Macbeth, Macbeth, beware, Macduff! For none of women bored shall harm Macbeth! Till Burnham would come to Dunsinane, don't you know? <laughs> oh, that's dead great! Then Mac what? Mac need? Mac I? Mac fear? Mac don't? <laughs> I see you, Jimmy, and know that I was from my mother's womb on timely rent. What do you think about that? Oh, I do not like it, but I support a woman's right to choose. <laughs> Lay on your great haggis face! Oh. <laughs> ah, me great! You murdered me babies! Uh, you shat in me stew! Oh, I did that! Oh, I ye they! I had to throw half of it away! Behold, 
where lies the usurper's cursed head. Macbeth, ye arse, is out the windy. And know that never was there a story or more blood and death than this or Mr. and Mrs. Macbeth. Thank you. Meanwhile, <laughs> Julius Caesar was a much beloved tyrant. All, All hail, hail Julius, Julius Caesar. Caesar. Hail, citizens! Who was worn by a soothsayer. Beware the Ides of March! <laughs> the great Caesar, however, chose to ignore the warning. What the hell are the Ides of March? The 15th of March. Well, that's today. <laughs> oh, 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 and two brute day! Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar. So let's bury it and get on with my play, Anthony and, and Cleopatra. Cleopatra. Oh, is this an asp I see before me? Oh, 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 oh,
Wait, isn't there something about the plot in there? The plot? <laughs> of course I cover the plot! What kind of scholar do you think I am? I cover the plot in depth in the footnote on page 29. Uh, Troilus, youngest son of Priam, king of Troy. Is oh, going uh, to... you be Troilus. Okay. And uh, uh, you be the king. Okay. Loves Cressida. And oh, sh I'll get the wig. <laughs> she uh, sets up a meeting with her uncle Pandarus. Though she feigns indifference, she is actually attracted to him. <laughs> Agamemnon, the commander of the Trojan army, of the Greek Agamemnon, show, show, show. This is boring, boring, boring. This is the kind of stuff that kids hate to study at school because it's so boring. boring. Yeah, like when you said Agamemnon, man, I was uh, asleep. No, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I told these guys, backstage, right before we went on, I told them, I will not do dry, boring, vomitless Shakespeare for these people. <laughs> it'll, just, it'll just turn you off to Shakespeare, you know? I mean, well, that's what happened to me when I was a kid in school. While we'd supposed to be studying this Shakespeare stuff, I'd be looking out the window at all the other kids playing ball. And I'd be thinking, well, why can't this Shakespeare stuff be more like sports? Sports? How do you mean? Yeah, you know, well, well like sports are, are visceral, you know, they're, they're exciting to watch. Uh, take the histories, for example. All those kings and queens killing each other off, the, the throne passing from one generation to the next. It's exactly like playing football, only, only you do it with a crown. <laughs> they are kind of similar, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Okay, line them up. Let's kick some royal ass. 25, 42, Richard III, Henry VI, part one, two, three, huh! And the crown is snapped to Richard II, that well-spoken 13th century heir. He's fading back to pass, looking for an heir down the field, but there's a heavy rush from King John. Earl of my ghost that sinks down my head! And the crown is in the air, and Henry VI comes up with it. Victory is mine! John that relic before a player for the 12th century, and he's down. Oh, it's killing him out there. This could be the end of the War of the Roses cycle. Huh? He's at the 30. The My 20. soul has no room. The 10. Oh, he's poisoned on the 10 yard line. <laughs> Looks like he's out for the game. Replacing him now, number 72, King Lear. Divide the kingdom in three. Cordelia, you go alone. Uh oh, a penalty marker is down. Fictional character on the field. Lear is disqualified. Oh, and he is not happy about it. Pocket! Okay. Lining up now is that father-son duo of Prince Hal and Henry IV. Santa snaps to the quarterback. Quarterback gives to the hunchback. Oh, no. It, it looks like Richard III's limp is giving him trouble. Oh, my horse! My horse! My king of the horse! Oh, no. There's a pile oh. up on the field. Fumble! And Henry Deere comes up with it. He's at the 20, the 15. The ten. Oh, he stops at the five to chop off his wife's head. Touchdown for the Red Rose! Oh, you gotta believe this is the beginning of a Tudor dynasty. Woo! Henry the fifth, Richard the third, the whole royal family's friggin' absurd, especially Charles. Ladies and gentlemen. 
gentlemen, 36 plays down, one to go. A play of such lofty, poetic, and phil- What? What? It's, it's, just, it's just that, you know, like, Hamlet is a very, like, serious, intense play, and I, I just don't think I'm up for it. <laughs> what do you mean? We've done 36 already. There's just one more. No, no, I know. It's just, it's just like the, the football game. You know, it, like, it left me emotionally and physically drained, and I just don't think I can do it justice. <laughs> We don't have to do it justice. We just have to do it. <laughs> well, I don't want to do it. Chris, our show is called The Complete Works of William Shakespeare. I think they'd like to see Hamlet, am I right? <laughs> okay, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll call it the, uh, the Complete Works of William Shakespeare, except Hamlet. <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Well, if, if you want to do it, you can go ahead and do it. I don't have to do it if I don't want to do it. I'm just going to sit out here, and I'm just going to sit out here with, with these people. They're my friends. I'm going to sit out here, and I'm going to watch you two do it. Chris, this guy's actually my brother. The last play to do is Hamlet, okay? Hi there. Yeah. Hey, let, let go of our actors. Let, let him go. We got to have Hamlet. Okay, all right, all right. Just don't touch me. Right. Are you okay? Fine. <laughs> We're gonna do Hamlet now, right? Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Jeez, you almost eat it right out of here. Sorry, I got a little messed up. But... All right, so we'll start off with the guard scene. We're gonna need Bernardo and Horatio. Uh, we'll need Rose and Prince and Guildenstern. Nah, no, they got the wrong Oh, where's he going? Get back! I'll kill this guy! I'll kill him! Just leave him alone! Stop! You can't make me do it! Get back here! intermission here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, get up, stretch your legs, have some cookies, some water. We're always funny when you've got sugar and water in your seat. <laughs> uh, we'll be back in like 15 minutes, and Joe and Chris should be back by then. And we'll see you later.
as you can see, Joe and Chris aren't back yet. <laughs> so Joe actually called me during an admission. He finally caught up to Chris. Chris was hiding in the Dorset quarry. <laughs> <laughs> but Joe had a great idea. Until they get back, I should cover the sonnets. <clears throat> Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets. And I uh, condensed them down to this uh, napkin here. And what I was thinking we could do is we could share this among the audience. And there's a lot of you, so there should be plenty of time for them to get back. And I forgot, we could start right here with you, young man, with your well dressed jacket there. Um, you want to take this, we'll read it, enjoy it. It's very good. And then when you're done with it, you pass it to her. And she'll, it. she'll enjoy it. And then when you're done with it, we'll just go down the aisle, all the way here, starting off to pass it to these couples over here. Don't forget these people over here. And back up to this, sir. And all the way across this row. And we'll go back and forth, back and forth, back. Back and forth until it gets all the way up to you way up there, ma'am. And by the time you get it, Joe and Chris should be back. <laughs> so, uh, Bob, can I have some house lights, please? <coughs> Thank you. All right, so, sir, just take it. Read it. Enjoy it. Okay. Take your time with it. Oh! oh, oh so Joe and Chris, everybody! Oh, Sorry to so long, everybody! Oh. Watch 
tonight. Perchance twill walk again. All is not well. Would the night were come? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. Oh, look for what it comes! <laughs> Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Mark me. Speak, I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. If ever thou didst thy dear father love, revenge his foul and unnatural murder. Murder? Murder? The serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. My uncle? Your uncle? Let not the royal bed become a couch. For incest. Incest? Ouch! I do, Hamlet, remember me. My lord, this is strange. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, so piss off. <laughs> I henceforth shall think meet to put an antic disposition on. <coughs> Time is out of joint. Cursed spite that ever I was born to exit right. <laughs> Neither a borrower nor lender be. Joe's favorite character on General Hospital. 
And we just found out Thursday she's not coming out of her coma. She's just got a puffy. <laughs> oh, so, uh, so I think for today, we're just going to skip this speech. Um, I'm sorry if anybody feels ripped off, but uh, we think it's a, a really overrated speech anyway. I mean, Hamlet is supposed to be thinking about killing his uncle. And instead, he's talking about killing himself. And we really feel that it just weakens the character. So we're just going to move on to a, a later part in the play. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's uh, move on to the oh, play within a play sequence. Right. Yeah. So we'll just, we'll just skip it for now, and we'll move on to a later part so you really don't miss anything. Oh, wait, 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 wait. There's that speech of Hamlet's I don't think we should cut. Oh. Oh, the what a piece of work is man's speech. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, right, well, right, okay. Uh, well, there's this one speech that goes, uh, I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, and forgone all custom of exercise. And indeed it goes so heavy with my disposition that this goodly frame of the earth seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave or hanging firmament, this most majestic roof fretted with golden fire, why, it appears to me no more than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. So let's skip that speech and go right into the killing. <laughs> Sort of 
create a supportive environment for, for Bob here. <laughs> everybody to act out what's going on inside Ophelia's head and divide everybody up into uh, Ophelia's id, ego, and superego. Oh, like a Freudian analysis. Yes, a Freudian analysis. Okay. <laughs> I get the id. All right, I'll get the ego. Uh, would you like to be our ego tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Of them all. 
because we're going to use you to draw this into a modern context. Okay? Because we want Ophelia to be revelant of women to, uh, to revelant of uh, women of today. Okay? All right. So um, maybe she wants uh, she wants power, but she doesn't want to give up her her femininity. You know, she she wants to be a corporate executive, but she also wants to have babies at the same time. And deep in her psyche, she just is tired of being the weightless hippie chick, and she wants to assert herself. And she just feels like saying. Look, cut the crap, Hamlet! My biological clock is ticking, and I want babies now! And it's that Alright, so why don't we just have you say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, alright, very good. Uh, section C will have you say, uh, Cut, cut the, the crap, crap, Hamlet! My <laughs> biological clock is ticking, and I want babies now! <laughs> alright, so let's, uh, let's give that a try, okay? Section C, one, two, three!
welcome to my mother. Behind the heiress, I'll convey myself to hear the process. Where's the goddamn heiress in this joint? Oh. Hamlet! Now what is it, mother? Thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, thou hast my father much offended. What wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me! Help! 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 Hello! No, no, a rat! Touch, I do confess. 
The queen carouses to your good fortune, Hamlet. Uh, dear maiden, do not drink that cup. I pray you, I will. Pardon me. It is the poisoned cup. It is too late. Come, for the third, Laertes. <laughs>
will now do it backwards. Uh, <laughs> yes, no. No, yes, no, Joe, you said we could do Hamlet backwards and forwards. No. It's a figure of speech. No, 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 no. We're not doing Hamlet backwards. And you, you ran out half a show. No, no, no. You know what? It's not. You have sense. I don't care. No, we didn't do that. You don't have to rehearse it all the time. No, no, no. Solid two two is that oh. <laughs> 